the deployment of technology and uh, the use of governance innovation um, uh, to, to manage uh, the unfolding challenges, both uh, socioeconomic as well as the health and human uh, challenges uh, which are uh, uh, brought upon uh, by, this, uh, uh, by this pandemic uh, in the last uh, 100 days in many parts of the world. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome a, a star cast uh, from India, Bangladesh and Africa and of course Geneva, uh, London and we will hear voices from different sectors in different parts of the world uh, and hear their take on uh, how technology, how innovation, how communities can work together in responding to uh, what is clearly the biggest challenge we have faced in this century and perhaps in the last hundred years. Um, uh, I'm going to start uh, this particular session by inviting the Chief Executive Officer of the of Niti Aayog, India's uh, official think tank and do tank, Mr. Amitabh Kant to speak to us and I'm going to uh, ask him the, to re respond to the broad uh, impulse of this program, which is uh, the deployment of technology, the deployment of innovation, the use of government policy and government tools uh, to protect the most vulnerable as the pandemic has unfolded uh, in the subcontinent. Mr. Samit Khan, thank you for joining us and over to you. Thank you, Samir. I'm uh, truly delighted to be a part of this uh, wonderful interaction on technology, governance, innovation and the pandemic and to discuss the responses from uh, South Asia and Africa. Uh, COVID-19 has been a pandemic like none other before. Uh, you know, the sheer scale, the global reach and the impact of the economic and societal upheaval caused. Uh, countries across the globe have felt the impact. From economic perspective, the most vulnerable seem to be at risk the most. And India's response to the pandemic can be captured actually across three broad buckets. Firstly, a focus on Antyodaya, that is people, uh, the weakest and the below the poverty line, the poorest of the poor, and our attempt at uplifting of the weakest uh, has been a key challenge. Secondly, I think focused handholding in the immediate term and thirdly, planning for the future and using technology in driving this. A crisis like COVID-19 pandemic has to be tackled by three interconnected levers, a frontline healthcare workers, infrastructure and medical facilities and technology. India actually took the early lead in leveraging technology to fight this enemy. It is evidently clear that India will play a major role in COVID-19 vaccine development. Approximately about 30 attempts are being made all across India. Uh, we drive almost 70% of the world's vaccine development and 30 attempts to develop the vaccines are being made in India. These include efforts where India is participating in global attempts and partnership among Indian academia and industry. Uh, Serum Institute of India, the world's largest vaccine maker by number of doses produced and sold globally, has partnered with AstraZeneca to supply 1 billion doses of University of Oxford's potential novel coronavirus, coronavirus or COVID-19 vaccine to low and middle income countries. Serum will provide 400 million doses before the end of 2020 as part of the arrangement. Uh, the AstraZeneca partnership is the latest in a series of arrangements that Serum has aimed in recent months as the coronavirus pandemic spread across continents. Besides securing a license to mass produce the University of Oxford vaccines, Serum has built an alliance with US biotech firm Corda Genesis. The latter will develop a five attenuated vaccine, a weakened virus that doesn't cause disease but triggers immune response to fight COVID-19 and Serum will invest in clinical trials, manufacturing and distribution. India's push for technology adoption across the board has led to a new paradigm, technology commons. That is rapid development and deployment of technology solutions for clearly defined use cases. The technology commons is defined by its collaborative nature. 
two possible ways to build technology commons have emerged a government led private sector enabled and secondly private sector led government enabled the development of arogya setu india's covid-19 contact tracing syndromic mapping and self assessment mobile application is a phenomenal examination ex unique example of the first model this app exemplifies public private partnership led by government and powered by the best of india from both public and private sector the app was conceptualized and developed in niti aayog in less than 3 weeks and involved more than 60 of the best from india's private sector across engineering product system architecture epidemiology data science healthcare privacy security ui design and translation involved in the project and it was backed by all of us some of the senior most leaders in the government since its launch on 2nd april 2020 the app has seen more than 135 million adoptions the fastest mobile app to reach 50 million users globally and one of the fastest entrants to the 100 million club more importantly though the trust shown by the people of india has enabled the arogya setu engine to generate incredible insights and impact precise projections of locality direction and velocity of the spread of infection the app offers a comprehensive suite of interventions against covid-19 and has registered several firsts in the 12 weeks since its launch the app possibly has the most reach and impact when compared to all other covid-19 contact tracing and self assessment tools combined globally while pioneering a new approach to data driven epidemiological flattening of the curve through syndromic mapping through a dedicated team of about 100 doctors arogya setu has been providing the safety net of requisite medical advice to those who have assessed themselves high risk the platform has reached out to more than 800000 users and is committed to providing reassuring reach of doctors to those in need arogya setu has alerted more than 160000 people so far of potential risk of moderate or high infection through bluetooth contacts traced from approximately 100000 users who have tested positive of the 150000 tested from the set of people assessed as high risk more than 38000 people have tested positive the efficacy of testing recommended by arogya setu thus is much higher than any testing protocol anywhere globally and many folds higher than the current overall efficacy of testing in india that is 5% we will be very happy to work in partnership with african countries and any country in south asia uh, to provide technical partnership on this it can easily be replicated so that the rest of the world learns and benefits from india's experience because the arogya setu team has predicted more than 13000 hotspots across the country at sub post office level the fusion of historic data with arogya setu crowdsource syndromic map continues to have enormous value in predicting hotspots at sub post office level granularity many of which might otherwise have been totally missed by us and infection would have gone on spreading from one place to another for example 140 predicted hot spots were declared around april 13th was subsequently verified as actual hot spots by the health ministry in the next 7 to 17 days therefore technology plays a key role in contact tracing which is the heart and soul of managing this virus the precision achieved by this unique combination of bluetooth based contact tracing and identification of hotspot holds the key to effectively breaking the chain of infection flattening the curve and saving lives and therefore 
we are willing to partner any country today to provide support and assistance in taking this technology forward adhering to the design principles of transparency privacy and security the code base for arogya setu has been open to the developer community releasing this open source code of a rapidly evolving product that is live at this massive scale with more than 135 million users is another first for any government product globally this also signifies government of india's commitment to create public good for all human kind india is keen to share learnings from our approach to technology to fight covid-19 and make the benefits of the solution available to the rest of the world arogya setu's question is suggesting whom to test and where to test more is an example of the digital india approach to our fight against covid-19 learning from this we came out with telemedicine guideline because our view is that covid will hamper face to face consultation and therefore based on these guidelines we launched free telemedicine consultation app swast and swast is another example of technology commons led by private sector and enabled by government government of india had released the telemedicine guideline in march 2020 and has been working in close collaboration with the private sector to build and innovate on this so as this coming together of more than 100 leading private hospitals health tech startups technology companies and investors so as partners include manipal hospitals and apollo hospitals e pharma and diagnostic startups new age medical and diagnostic chain uh, and e-commerce firms among others the grouping will make available free type free treat uh, teleconsultations through a network of over 2000 certified and trained doctors the private sector's contribution in manufacturing covid-19 related essentials in other is another great example India has become a global manufacturing hub for PPPs and ventilators. We had zero level of PPE and ma- ventilator manufacturing ability when the crisis broke out. India was not producing any PPP kits. Now India is producing 600,000 PPE kits and 1000 ventilators daily. And we are not actively considering exporting and we are now we are now actually actively considering exporting ppps and ventilators to the rest of the world and making india a manufacturing hub for the world india's automakers took the lead in in making ventilators india's textile manufacturers took the lead in making masks and ppe and more with little or no prior knowledge of making this these equipments it is astonishing as to how the workers and adopted themselves and rolled out approved necessities ladies and gentlemen in the west leaders are figuring out how to distribute benefits to their citizens mark anderson of anderson horowitz recently wrote in a blog in the us we don't even have the ability to get federal bailout money to the people and businesses that need it tens of millions of laid off workers and their families and many millions of small businesses are in serious trouble right now a government that collects money from all its citizens and businesses each year has never built a system to dis- to distribute money to us when it's needed most compare this to india where we have built diligently for past several years aadhar coverage through biometric is more than 95% of in a population of 1.3 billion monthly transaction values of upi for digital payment is more than 1.2 billion close to 400 million bank accounts of people were opened india undertakes accumulative direct benefit transfer when i was a young officer money used to be transferred from center to state to villages and almost 85% used to be leakage 
But now we do a cumulative direct benefit transfer of close to 160 billion in 426 operational schemes across 56 ministries. There is not a single paisa of leakage now. Direct benefit transfer and governance reforms have increased government's efficiency to target beneficiaries directly. This has enabled India to remove duplicate and fake beneficiaries and plug leakages. The resultant savings from this alone last year has been over 25 billion US dollars. The building of technology infrastructure is now being used to deliver much needed support to the lower income strata of the country, be it benefits related to food, uh, be it direct benefit transfer or health care. We are providing medical insurance cover of rupees 5 million per healthcare workers and we have a health insurance scheme called the Ayushman Bharat, the PMJ, uh, Jan Arogya Yojana, which covers 500 million people of India. It is totally paperless, cashless and digital. It is the world's biggest health insurance scheme. Ladies and gentlemen, we do all this digitally. Notwithstanding the impact of COVID-19, India is on the cusp of a tremendous opportunity for both economic progress and improvement in the general well-being of its citizens. The future for India is technology powered by active collaboration and enabled by the best from both public and private sector. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. It's been a real pleasure to give this keynote address. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kant. I think you've given us all a lot of food for thought. I'm going to let Peter settle down. He has just joined us um, uh, from Nigeria. I'm going to let him settle down. Let me turn to Kate. Kate, I'm going to just play it by the ear. I think uh, he has raised a lot of issues uh, that in some sense encompass any government response or any community's response to the pandemic. Uh, uh, you know, uh, I would like you to particularly focus on three areas, uh, gender, women, uh, climate change and and uh, perhaps uh, India Africa partnership and then I will or a South Asia Africa partnership and then I'll turn to my colleagues from South Asia and Africa and, and Ambassador Gill from Geneva uh, to discuss this so over to you Kate. Thank you. Um, so, I mean, there are so many interesting things to talk about on this topic and uh, and and Mr. Kant's intervention, I thought was particularly interesting around a focus on empowering the individual through digital and improving government effectiveness, which I think is going to be a key part of uh, of the recovery story. So from our perspective, a um, philanthropy we fund all over the world. So we have offices in Addis, Nairobi, uh, Delhi and Beijing, as well as in London. Um, and so we're, we're trying to identify best practices all over the world and encourage collaboration, um, particularly South-South collaboration, um, and try and decolonize development um, because philanthropy is obviously part of, uh, part of that heritage. And so I was really excited to join this panel uh, to have a conversation about uh, South Asian and African collaboration. Um, in terms of our work, we're looking at a, a three layered crisis. So there is the long crisis of globalization, um, many of the structural difficulties that we face that have been brought up in sharp relief um, with regards to the COVID crisis with the most vulnerable uh, increasingly uh, uh, the most affected by COVID. Um, so you have the acute global uh, health crisis of COVID, then you have the long term socioeconomic impacts of that, the secondary and tertiary effects of that, which will last much longer. And from the perspective of a philanthropy focused on children, we're really worried about what we call scarring of this generation by this crisis in multiple ways. So uh, children missing vaccinations, uh, young people missing out on school, uh, mothers not getting the kind of antenatal care that they need, which will have knock on effects uh, for their families and communities. So we look at this in, in, in that way. There were the existing structural difficulties and now on top we have the health crisis and the socioeconomic impacts um, and the scarring uh, and multiple dimensions. So to answer uh, Samir's questions, um, I think coming out of this crisis uh, on, on, and this is the, the bit that relates to climate change, it's not about greening the recovery. It is that the best recovery is a green recovery. So in previous, uh, in previous crises, actually a lot of the shovel ready projects were in high carbon traditional sectors. 
that's no longer the case. If you look at the latest research and if you look at the economics of renewables and many other clean technologies, in fact, if you want labor intensive fast with big multipliers, green actually gives you a better recovery uh, than pouring money into high carbon incumbents, which will result in assets stranding later and create huge problems for taxpayers in the long term. So I think it's really crucial uh, that all countries think about how we're going to attract uh, investment in a highly competitive environment. Um, and private investors uh, are not going to be looking for uh, the investments of the past. They're not going to be looking for uh, assets that require propping up and subsidies by governments. Um, they're going to be looking for assets um, that, whose economics are going to improve uh, over time um, as technology uh, uh, improves. So I, I really think that there's a huge growth story here in terms of the, the recovery. Um, and, and we know, obviously, in India that solar power is already 14 percent cheaper than than coal. Um, I think there's also plenty of examples where India has led the world, for example, with LED light bulbs and is now doing so. Uh, there's opportunities in air conditioning um, and um, other other sectors uh, where obviously uh, India could become a really, really, really significant lighthouse for the world. Um, and I think many of you will remember in the run up to Paris, um, in Indian French collaboration around the International Solar Alliance uh, was, was crucial um, in making sure that solar became more accessible uh, to the world. And India's latest effort of One Solar, One World, One Grid is a really, really exciting development. I think it's by far one of the most exciting developments that we've seen uh, uh, recently. And I think we should also, when we're talking about climate change, talk about clean air. Uh, a recent survey by Clean Air Fund that did polling in India, Nigeria, Bulgaria, Poland and England showed that 85 percent of people in India and 90 percent of people in Nigeria are worried about the health impacts of air pollution and want stricter laws and enforcement of regulations so they don't return to breathing toxic air. So there's a real opportunity uh, as uh, governments um, uh, build a, a cleaner recovery um, to really take advantage of the fact that the public are, are with them and in fact sometimes ahead of them. And as we all know, air pollution massively increases vulnerability uh, to COVID and other uh, respiratory syndromes. So um, really lots and lots of connectivity here between the environmental and the health side. And that's also true when it comes to zoonotic disease. We know that zoonotic disease comes from wildlife trade, but it also comes from just depletion of air ecosystems um, and bad management of intensive animal husbandry and actually connecting healthier food systems, land use and zoonotic disease will enable us to not just be prepared for pandemics, but actually, actually prevent them. You, the second thing you mentioned, Samir, was around gender. And I think it's really clear that um, the crisis has been particularly cruel to, to women. And I'm very worried about the young girls um, all around the world who have become increasingly vulnerable to domestic violence, um, uh, gender-based violence, early pregnancy. And we know that when there are crises that result in increased poverty for families, child marriage massively increases. So I think there's a really important job to do around the world to make sure that after the lockdown, girls are going back to school, that they're not getting married, that they're not getting pregnant, that they're going back to school. Um, and of course, when you have uh, an interruption in education like, like COVID, we need to start thinking about how we can bridge the digital divide that will enable girls um, and young women who are making the transition to work. Um, we need to think about how to give them access to digital tools that will enable them to continue their learning uh, when there are significant interruptions related to, uh, to pandemics. Um, so we're doing a lot of work at the moment looking at how we can help girls um, as they pass 18th, um, sorry, 8th, 10th and 12th grade exams. Um, how can we use digital technology to improve retention? Um, and at the same time, we're also using uh, technology to look at how we can tackle um, gender norms about masculinity 
toxic masculinity, uh, norms, social norms that hold girls and women back using technology and social media. So there are lots of opportunities also for improving the life skills of young people um, um, as we improve um, access to digital technology. Um, we also have a lot of work that we're doing in uh, many countries around the world in relation to uh, M Health. Um, we have started a number of programs, um, in particular using patient tracking uh, to reduce corruption in the health sector, um, to enable pregnant women to track uh, their progress through the antenatal system, to improve the performance of, of clinics and, and give them bonuses when they provide quality treatment. Um, this has been really, really helpful uh, for women uh, during the uh, pandemic to stay connected to their clinicians. Um, and our work with Medic Mobile uh, in Africa, um, we've rolled out uh, COVID tracking and surveillance in Kenya, Niger and Mali um, using the platform that we are already using for, for routine uh, primary health. And there are lots of opportunities um, as well in the field of, of AI uh, and, and telemedicine that we're only just scratching uh, the surface on. Um, and I, you know, I always point to the example when I talk to friends who aren't in the health sphere of uh, Ethiopia's uh, rapidly digitizing health service and the fact that, you know, five years ago and seven years ago when I had a baby, I had to carry around my big antenatal paper folder around different London hospitals and clinics. Um, and uh, in Ethiopia now, in some of the areas where we're trialing digital health with uh, a fingerprint, um, you can automatically bring up uh, all of your all of your health records no matter where you check in to the health system. So I think there are lots of opportunities for, for South-South collaboration in these areas um, and uh, I'm, I'm really excited to continue the conversation with the rest of you. I think I've used up all my time actually. Um, I would just say a final word on um, COP26 and India-UK collaboration, if I may. Um, I'm working as a friend of, of, of COP26, um, which, as you know, has been delayed because of COVID to next year. And I would really like to see uh, the UK and India step up collaboration in support of uh, um, the rollout of, of clean energy across the world. I think there's a real opportunity. India has a massive opportunity domestically, but also internationally uh, to be a leader in solar power, but also uh, storage. And so I'm very much hoping that um, something like a, a super fund, a UK-India collaborative super fund could be set up um, mm -hmm. that could really um, make a huge contribution to the world and, and particularly in Africa where we're doing work on um, water and sanitation and solar pumps and electrifying villages and health clinics and, and schools, uh, you know, Indian expertise um, could be really, really, really beneficial in Africa um, as they scale up their, their, their electrification plans. So thanks ever so much, Samir. I hope that covers some of the topics you wanted me to touch on. No, you, you have. Thanks a lot. And that brings us I think uh, that brings us very nicely to uh, uh, Peter, who's a director, Environmental Sciences and Technology, Federal Ministry of uh, Science and Technology, in Nigeria. So you're one of the largest technology markets and account for almost a quarter of all Africa's internet users. Uh, how has the Nigerian experience been in using this technology to respond to the pandemic? And how important and useful it would it be to build a India, Africa, India, a Nigeria technology bridge uh, to share our own uh, discoveries. Over to you, Peter, and thank you for joining us. Uh, good afternoon, uh, fellow speakers. Um, uh, so sorry that I connected late because the the link sent to me. Um, I, I did not receive the link, so I just received it, and I'm, I'm happy to be on this um, session with you. Uh, it's really very interesting. I must commend you, Mr. President, for uh, organizing this webinar and, um, of course, continuing the discussion we had before, how we can uh, leverage on on the discussion already started, the Africa, the dialogue, the global dialogue, how we can leverage on that platform and, of course, connect developing countries 
with the developing countries and developed countries and see how we can uh, how we can improve the socioeconomic development using technology towards 2030 SDG 2030 so it's good this webinar is coming um, you remember we planned to have a sustainability dialogue in Nigeria uh, possibly next two months, but due to COVID, it's no longer happening. Uh, regarding the efforts of government in Nigeria, COVID actually has presented a very big challenge to global community. But for us, at the same time, it is also an opportunity. And these opportunities we, we've been trying to harness using technology, leveraging on technology. What have we done since that COVID? We have tried to reach out to Nigerian citizens using technology, using the mass media, using uh, several meetings that are going on online. So there is increased need for bandwidth. There's also an increased need for infrastructure. Uh, there's also an increased demand for energy. So all these present their unique challenges, which government has been trying to tackle. Just a few days ago, just yesterday, the Federal Executive Council approved what is called a post-COVID sustainability plan uh, in the sum of 2.3, over 2 mil trillion Naira. Now, what that plan is, how do we sustain the economy and control the the, the pandemic and how do we after the pandemic before during and after the pandemic how do we sustain the economy going forward a number of things have been put in place first to tackle the infrastructure you know infrastructure has been a problem not just in Nigeria but in Africa infrastructural deficit government is, has has made so much in terms of uh, plans, in terms of planning the human resources, in terms of funding, in terms of uh, governance, improving the governance systems to see that one, the infrastructure deficit is tackled. In fact, the, the, the post, the post uh, sustainability plan is addressing mainly the infrastructure deficit in the area of power, in the area of transportation, in the area of agriculture, in the area of, of course, improving technology. We are also looking at, uh, from the point of view of the ministry, Nigeria is blessed with so much uh, material resources and of course the human being. So how do we connect all of this? How do we add value to the materials, raw materials that we have? We have huge oil and gas deposits. We have huge deposits in for gas revenues. Now, how do we add value to this? Going forward, government is coming up with networks and plans to see that we add value to the materials we have, that we improve on our educational system, that we add value using technology, and the latest that we are doing in the ministry is to add value, do what undertake what is called gas beneficiation program so gas expansion program in Nigeria currently Nigeria is the tenth the ninth in terms of gas reserves we have proven reserves of 200 trillion cubic feet standard cubic feet proven reserves and it is the plan of government that we need to add value to this unlike what we had during the crude oil Know where you export your crude oil. Now the government is trying to look at the uh, policy of adding value to gas that will develop lead to development of a chain of industries down the line. The chemical industries, the transportation industries, the electricity generation industries, all of this will add up to creation of massive job and of course creation of wealth. But at the root of this, how do we engage the youths? We have a youth population of over 70%. How do we engage this youth population 
and turn this capital, these assets, turn it into uh, uh, productive, uh, 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 make them productive to actually add to the fortunes of, of the economy, keeping them working, keeping the economy working, and of course, keeping the population busy. This is one way uh, the recent plan of government, the, the, the just approved by the Federal Executive Council yesterday, we think this is one way of one, creating jobs for the youths, improving on the economy, undertaking value addition to our raw materials, and of course, in all of this, the cross-cutting issue in all of this is technology. So how do we improve the infrastructure of technology in the area of improving transportation services, looking at our energy infrastructure, improving our energy infrastructure, particularly electricity? How do we incentivize the working of small, medium enterprises? All these policies are geared towards improving the small, medium enterprises to add to the economy, to improve on their productivity, to improve on their contribution to the uh, GDP. Uh, so what are the key milestones we have achieved so far? The government has come up with reviewed policy framework. And we are looking at reg regulatory framework across board. Government has also come in with uh, financial support in form of incentives to the SMEs. And in all of this, it's the hope of government that if all these are properly implemented, definitely we will be on the way, the first COVID will be on the way towards achieving the SDG 2030. So with this, you um, need to elaborate more as the discussions go on. Thank you very much, Chairman. Patricia has joined us. We will give her a few minutes to settle down. Uh, let me turn to uh, Ambassador Gill, who is Director of the Global Health Center Project, International Digital Health and AI Research Collaborative. And he has been trying to build schemes that will help create partnerships between uh, regions such as Africa and South Asia. Uh, Ambassador Gill, over to you. Thank you very much, Samir. So I'll come to this particular focus of our discussion today, which is this bridge building between Africa and South and Southeast Asia uh, through technology uh, and innovation. But before that, just a few words about uh, IDARE, since many of you uh, may not have heard about this. This is a follow up initiative to the UN Secretary General's high level panel on digital cooperation, which uh, Melinda Gates and Jack Ma chaired and which had a heavy focus on uh, the kind of technology commons that uh, Sri Amitabh Kant, the CEO of Niti Aayog, spoke about. Uh, so these digital public goods that allow inclusive access to tools for uh, transformation, uh, and then which uh, allow data and AI to be used at the service of the uh, SDGs. Uh, our uh, goal within the next two years is to uh, build towards a launch at a prestigious event such as India's G20 presidency, where we come out with a CERN-like platform for solving global challenges around digital health and uh, AI research for health, but also an impact fund, a significant impact fund then that invests in Africa, South and Southeast Asia in the kind of interoperable digital infrastructure, in the kind of uh, digital commons that would be needed uh, to enable the use of digital technologies uh, uh, for health. Now, uh, in, in the first part of our discussion, we've heard about how technology is being used uh, to enable the response to this pandemic and also to plan for the economic recovery. I would say there are three areas where it has worked re reasonably well. One is the information risk management side. Um, the other is the modeling side, the predicting of the spread of the disease and uh, the burden on the health system, on the healthcare cascade. Uh, and the third, which was um, uh, referred to by uh, our keynote speaker, the tracing, contact tracing uh, app, the contact tracing digital tools side of it. 
At the same time, this interest in digital technologies, the new opportunities that have opened up, have also shown us glaring gaps in terms of where we are. I mean, I think one of the speakers mentioned AI in this, so I see very little AI currently being used. So 99% of what is claimed to be AI is actually sophisticated data science, so there's still a lot of hype. So you see a problem at the policy science interface. Leaders are not yet convinced that digital can bring about transformation in these lumpy, challenging areas like health and education. The other problem that I see is despite increased data sharing, flow of information, rapid genomic sequencing data uh, through platforms, digital platforms like GISAID, uh, research collaboration around data are still very few and far between. So we've not seen data sharing even at the local level. I know the problems around transbound boundary sharing of data, but even in local settings between hospitals, clinics, research institutions, Sometimes within the same government, we have not seen the kind of data sharing that should be seen. And the last problem we see is despite the, the, the modeling efforts and so on, modeling diversity is very lacking. There are only a few globally recognized models, Imperial College, you know, IDM Seattle, etc. So models coming out of local settings in Nigeria, India, other places, Bangladesh are not really there. And uh, the kind of real time data integration that we need for pandemic surveillance for predicting the spread of the next one, we are nowhere close to it. So I think we should have this sobering assessment with us uh, as well. Now coming to the, the bridge building possibility, South South Cooperation as Kate referred to it. I mean, in the 70s, 80s, we heard a lot about South South Cooperation and then it disappeared. Uh, now, where is the opportunity today? I think something that Peter mentioned, we have digital natives in Africa and Asia. So uh, uh, of the, you know, the median age, around 29 in Africa. So you have a youthful population that's confident that uses digital tools and that can be not just the users and consumers of products, but that can also contribute to entrepreneurship research. The other thing is data awareness, particularly around genomics. Both Africa and South and Southeast Asia are genomics data billionaires. We've not even touched this area yet. Uh, so beyond the usual use cases that you see around infectious diseases, there's a host of other health issues that both these geographies own. And therefore, if you have localized use of data and egg, aggregation of data and use cases at the local level, you can build strong economies, digital health economies and broader AI and data economies around those uh, uh, attributes. And then a very important factor is there is no legacy uh, of um, systems such as the locked private sector ecosystem you see in the US around data uh, and around digital. Uh, there is no legacy of the kind of uh, hospital information sharing systems that you see in Europe or the kind of supply chain, locked supply chain data sets that you see. So there is an opportunity, a whiteboard, blue sky type of an opportunity to build these common rails and these guardrails for using um, digital technologies uh, for uh, public health. What is missing to build the bridge? So I've laid out the case for the bridge uh, and I've tried to paint a picture of the technology background. But what is missing is really uh, the investments, the political interests and the platforms to enable that co uh, collaboration. And I think there, you know, if we keep thinking about we will develop or we'll take, ex take expertise from one geography to another that, uh, you know, it's not really going to work. I mean, if you say Indian IT expertise will do this in Africa, no, excuse me, maybe not, you know, or the molecular science expertise in UK is going to help South South cooperation, maybe, but maybe not. What you need by design is collaborations where you have researchers and entrepreneurs from these geographies actually owning up, having agency over the design of the research, the development of these public goods. So I think this is the approach that we are going to take in IDEA. Mm -hmm. And hopefully over the next two years, we'll be able to establish in key areas like interoperable uh, digital infrastructures, benchmarking or digital health solutions, uh, real-time epidemiology, real-time integration of diagnostics data flows. 
in this distributed manner, the local setting, the district level setting, the provincial level setting and the national setting, rather than those kind of plans where you know data moves across borders. That's not going to happen. In fact, learning needs to move across borders. Uh, the algorithms uh, the, um, uh, the uh, need to move in a way that uh, their use is trusted, whether it is round robin movement of algorithms, AI algorithms, or it is a federated use of these AI algorithms with these local data sets and these local use cases. Thank you very much. I look forward to the discussion. Uh, Ambassador Gill, uh, as part of your um, intervention, let me also take a commitment from you that post this meeting, you will reach out to both Peter and Patricia and uh, see if uh, IDAIR can bring both Ghana and Nigeria into their uh, early conversations for your uh, future plans. I think that with pleasure. We'll have a full time uh, from next month, full time colleague leading an IDAIR hub in Nairobi and look forward to working with both Ghana and Nigeria. Thank you. Uh, uh, I, I want to now go to uh, uh, Patricia and to Nisha, and then I want to uh, uh, bring up the rare end of this conversation. But let me turn to uh, 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 Madam Minister. Uh, Patricia, thank you for joining us. I know you were struggling with uh, uh, internet and, and uh, 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 getting online, but thank you so much that you were able to join us. Um, and it's always a pleasure to have you with us at ORF. Uh, my simple proposition to you has, is on uh, uh, what has been the deployment of technology in the response to the pandemic um, as the Minister for uh, Environment, Science, Technology and Innovation. Do you think that the Ghana's innovation ecosystem is responding to the challenges? Yes, uh, thank you very much and uh, I thank you for bringing me into this conversation. We are all aware that the COVID pandemic response by the government of Ghana has been typically a science-based one. And the challenge to an effective implementation has been the lack of accurate data. Mm -hmm. Data has always been the problem. Then uh, this is the reason why that we clearly feel that it's essential that we establish the right database, the infrastructure systems, the, uh, pre, uh, the uh, facilitated trained personnel, because at that point in time, we didn't have that trained personnel because this is a purely public health issue and you needed people with knowledge and the, the required training to be able to handle all these things. But in, in Ghana, what we have done so far is to establish a center, which we call uh, the, the center that we, we call the Center for uh, Ghana Health Emergency Command Center. And at this center, what we are trying to do is to contact tracing uh, activities that have been going on, is to make sure that we have the right contact tracing. And the center is to provide a platform for a timely, accurate and proper collection of an analysis and use of data, the movement of people, formulation of policies and issuance of directive and delivery intervention. And we believe with that in addressing this issue, we have to look at the horizontals and the verticals. What are we talking about when we talk about the horizontals? We are looking at the talent development, how we can uh, have the appropriate uh, skills that can always deal with uh, uh, pandemics of this nature. And then we need to identify people with the ideas, the right ideas, innovative ideas that can address these issues. And then we'll look at the capital that will be required, the kind of investment that will be required look at its risk factors and then the right actors at this at this point in time and the support that will be required to address the decision these are all things that we identify then we'll look at the business development or the entrepreneurs that can easily undertake these issues uh, i will really refer you to one of the things that even happened in the face of this pandemic where we had individuals who developed 
uh, watch the sun, sun, uh, sunset, sunset uh, ma materials that can be moved around. And if we are looking at the possibility of upscaling some of these initiatives to make sure that in the face of other pandemics, we can always solve these problems. And then we will have people who have used various local materials to develop things like the protective mask. Uh, we are also looking at the hand wash system. And in Ghana, people were able to even come up with the Initially, we were not even developing our own uh, sensitize, uh, sanitizers, but it became very critical that we have to encourage people to develop these things uh, or manufacture these things within the, uh, the, the what is available in the country because all airports were shut. So what was we uh, well, what was happening was that we have to use local materials to ensure that we can come up with all these PPEs. Even the development, we have the uh, issue of what kind of partnership that must be developed. Uh, in the trade sector, for instance, we, we have people who have uh, women that have formed their own industries and they were working together to manufacture these PPEs at a very large scale. And it is one of the areas where we are looking to encourage and ensure that they can upscale and produce more in terms of needs. And then we'll have the private sector too, the public sector partnership, and then ensuring that we can develop these uh, sectors appropriately. What has helped us a lot is the policies that were developed. We have our parliamentary uh, uh, and uh, 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 our cabinet and the parliamentary structure that had really supported us to come up with actionables, things that we need, the actions that we need to undertake to make sure that we people would adhere and would control the spread of uh, this uh, COVID virus. And then we also came up with direct uh, incentive where the government was given the, the, the full support to ensure that in times of needs, it can come out with any kind of uh, uh, any kind of directive that will help to control such pandemics. And these things have all been well laid out. And then the last thing has been the infrastructure. But in the face of our innovative uh, ecosystem, we are also looking at how we can relate with the other sectors of the economy. I'm looking at the, the, the verticals, uh, and that one I'm looking at health issues, I'm looking at the kind of food that we eat. Our president had to even prescribe that we have natural foods that needs to be uh, undertaken by our people. So these are, but we had the research uh, food research centers that have actually come out with these needs to ensure that we can boost the immune systems of the individuals within the economy. So it is one within the country. So it is one area that we look at the research aspect that mm -hmm. we need that we have enhanced the development of our research centers. And then we also look at the ICT, the use of it. People were locked up in their homes. Mm -hmm. And what was happening? Almost all businesses were coming to a standstill. The use, the encouragement to let people use the technologies that will be required to be able to communicate and get the right uh, help where it is. And then manufacturing, uh, that one I've already mentioned that uh, that has been boosted. We've encouraged people to produce the right. Uh, then we are looking at renewable energies. Ghana has always been looking at the uh, uh, hydro energy, but we, at this point in time, we want to deploy the the use of uh, uh, the uh, uh, is it atomic energy? What is it? Nuclear energy to turn it into 
to ensure that our factories or the manufacturing sector will always have the electricity and even our health systems will have the electricity to help to uh, uh, deal with the issues. And then the pharmaceuticals, that with the application of both the former uh, chemical uh, medicines as against the, the local herbs or herbal medicine that is also adopted here. It is well known that the herbs are even given or the herbal medicine are being uh, given, uh, uh, people are reacting or responding fast, faster by the application of the herbal medicine. So it's also one area that we are trying to enhance. And then we're also looking at how we can ensure that all the, because we've had an issue with data and we have an issue with connecting data with the right players or the right partners, it is very critical that our uh, Ghana Innovation and Technology Research Center uh, will be able to co uh, coordinate these activities and ensure that each sector, or it will be a pivot to where all these centers can relate and then they form the right uh, uh, synergies to ensure that we enhance the, our innovation ecosystems. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Madam Minister. Uh, I hope um, uh, after this uh, seminar is over, uh, Ambassador Gail uh, Anir from Bangladesh, Nisha from Bangalore, Peter from Nigeria, you can all talk to each other about your uh, technology experiences and see if there is a partnership that can be built. Uh, and with that, let me come to Nisha. Uh, Nisha, you heard uh, uh, Mr. Khan make a strong pitch for technology. You are someone who is uh, in the business of using technology uh, for creating solutions. And my question to you is that uh, uh, as at the Center for Cellular and Molecular Platform, CCAM in, uh, in Bangalore, um, how has been your experience with the COVID-19 Innovations Accelerator? And uh, do you see a natural partnership emerge uh, in South Asia with Africa for the work you're doing? Samir, thank you very much. Uh, it's, it's great to be here and talk about some of the uh, transformational steps India has taken. Uh, so I'll go directly to the deeper technology that India has developed uh, in the COVID era, right? Uh, I think from our observations, uh, always crises provide a tremendous opportunity to uh, figure out new socioeconomic models. And there is no doubt in my mind that for India today, this pandemic has been become one of the strongest catalysts for what I call the Indian Healthcare Innovation Inc. Right. So just to give some background here. Now, India's life sciences research has been very strong. It's been strong since the 50s or the 60s. A uh, lot of research, a uh, lot of development but not we, we started focusing on innovation only in the last 10 years. So there was a nascent innovation ecosystem that had to fight very hard with uh, import, imported medical technology or uh, external competition or foreign competition to even compete and get into the Indian market. What happened with COVID is for the first time, global demand for all these products surged, medical tech, uh, PPE, respiratory aids, and across the plethora, we saw that we could not get these you know, we could not we could not get these technologies in in time. And on top of that, India has a large population. We're about one nearly 1.4 billion. And so even the scale with what we required was very different from a lot of other countries. So the for the first time in a long time, we there was a nationwide call for indigenous and high quality medical products that India could deploy really quickly to save our population. This became very apparent in mid-March that we faced a severe shortage of diagnostic kits and respiratory aids and ventilators. And then immediately this call was put out. The government of India was foremost in putting this call out. And I think the domestic innovation community responded tremendously to this call. So just bef quickly before I go into what is a new normal for technology development in India, especially in life sciences, thanks to COVID, I want to point out that very quickly, we had so many startups that were responding with great rapid diagnostic technologies, with uh, screening technologies, ventilators and respiratory aids, uh, with ways to prevent the spread of the virus. So 
uh, new types of uh, sanitizers, new types of air decontamination devices, uh, and a whole host of technologies there. Then even ancillary technologies like cold storage, right? We suddenly became aware of the fact that we don't have cold storage facilities and a cold storage chain in India. So that became at the forefront of innovation very suddenly. And then obviously therapeutic candidate development. So India's strong life sciences research came into question because we started looking at uh, immunology. We started looking at genetics. We started looking at uh, virology very differently compared to before because this was so, this was such an imminent threat. And of course, vaccine development, which Dr. Kant spoke about already. Now, apart from the quantum of new innovation that's coming out very suddenly, there are certain dynamics that changed in India, and that's what's got me most excited from our observations here at CCAMP, right? Now, India is, as I mentioned, a traditionally a large medical solutions importer. So for the first time, there was a nationwide push for local innovation, especially since supply chains were down, uh, manufacturing chains in other countries were down. We realized that some, you know, we could manufacture components of a technology, but other components had to be imported. So suddenly that whole chain of import and manufacturing became crystal clear and we could figure out where the fault lines were. And that learning was very crucial. And in the face of reduced global competition, I think Indian innovators were encouraged by the strong local pull effect for their products, for their solutions. And that was a tremendous catalyst for them because this was the first time for many innovators that they had felt a pull effect for their solutions and for their products. So that became very important. And then more importantly, local innovations like diagnostic kits, like PPE and respiratory aids started entering the market in record times. Now we have to remember that in India, uh, the, unfortunately the regulatory authorities have traditionally been a little slow in certifying products and allowing products to go to the market or even into clinical trials. But suddenly because of COVID, because of the severe shortage, regulatory authorities started working at record time and that absolutely changed the face of products getting into the field and get, getting real time validation in field conditions for during the pandemic. And this changed the way so many of our innovators even approach innovation now because they've seen this, this new side of Indian innovation and how the public takes their products. So the quality of these products were validated. And now India recognizes that domestic innovators can design and build products at the same global quality, but with a very important difference. India recognizes frugal innovation for a very simple reason. We're a very large economy. We're slowly going towards becoming a middle income economy. India does not pay for very high, uh, very high priced products. So whatever quality that they have to maintain at the same high standards as international companies, they have to do it at frugal in uh, frugal prices. And that I think is where the USP of Indian innovation is because suddenly, you know, we're speaking about cross border with the other ASEAN countries with Africa and uh, you know, people who, uh, again, all these countries are inching towards becoming middle income economies. And so these frugal but high quality products become extremely important. And I think that's where Indian innovation has come to a whole other level. Now, apart from this, we also realized uh, these were learnings at the deep technology level. A lot of innovators had some product that was selling for purpose A. And they suddenly realized that they could re-engineer it or uh, just change the way they use it to serve the COVID related purposes. And that changed a lot of things. I'll give you an example. There's a startup that was working on retinal therapeutics, but it reconfigured its entire stem cell program. So a stem cell platform. So they could now rapidly screen for therapeutic candidates against COVID. So that is so powerful because that platform is already readily available. It is validated. It has put products out into the market. Now they only have to tweak it and now start looking at different use cases. And you, they don't have to stop at COVID. They can now use their platform for all these other diseases that they may not have realized that the platform could solve. So that's where I, the Indian uh, innovation is becoming very exciting. And of course, in this emergency, we have cut through a lot of red tape. We've cut through bureaucratic procedures. And so now this highlights multiple ways in which we can streamline our regulatory uh, processes. We can streamline our whole life cycle from, uh, you know, our very early candidates or our very early ideas through a prototype, through product, through field conditions. So that streamlining is going to be very important for the Indian economy. So in effect, I think India has a new normal for health innovation. More importantly, it is far higher 
far more dis defensible than we ever thought it would be maybe in the, even in the next five or 10 years. We've already reached it quickly because of COVID. So unfortunately, it took a crisis to get there, but this crisis has provided a beautiful opportunity for India's Healthcare Innovation Inc. Now, the challenge would be to maintain this new normal, to maintain these accelerated emergency innovation routines, as I call them, because that will create a paradigm shift in the way India innovates. So the entire machinery needs to be primed. We have to look at product development, scaling up, how the government uh, uh, approaches working with these startups, working with innovation hubs to help them scale up technologies. That I think will become crucial. And now the, the other important thing is the broader global ecosystem was always interested in India's growth story because uh, we're the third largest startup ecosystem after US and China. We've, we've, we've seen trim explosive growth over the last decade, or in fact, for the last three decades since 1991, when our economy was liberalized, right, when we opened up. So we're the most heavily watched, heavily monitored growth ecosystems in the world. And now the global community is, uh, is, 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 is noticing that India's innovation is coming out with all these emergency routines for COVID. And now the exciting thing is we can now turn the equation on our import exports from becoming a mass importer. We can now start becoming an exporter of our technologies uh, uh, to, uh, to middle income economies as well as to developed economies. And that will bring more uh, profits and more growth to India. And that will be very exciting to look at. Now, I, I will finish my remarks very quickly with this indigenization uh, and self-reliance scheme that uh, our prime minister has taken us towards with the most recent reforms he, he mentioned. We absolutely have to become self-reliant in the health sphere. We cannot afford to be taken aback again by a pandemic like COVID. And so that's why it becomes very important for our self-reliance to work out all these systems and be ready. Uh, a great example for us is now, we, we came out with almost 25 to 30 really good high quality diagnostic methods for COVID, but we quickly realized that all our diagnostic reagents come from China. And because those supply chains have been disrupted, because we're not getting the in, enough materials in, we, we have the technology for diagnostics, but we have to build up this whole supply chain for reagents. We have to be able to produce it. And that, so now these, there are so many upstream and downstream effects that India has noticed, the world has noticed, and we can now start tweaking this together to make India uh, more reliant, uh, more self-reliant. So personally, in the uh, in in the health spectrum, I would like to see more uh, more focus on our pharmaceutical uh, industry, uh, bring down the regulations. It's a, it's an extremely over-regulated market today, and I want to be able to see some. A deregulation so that our pharmaceutical industries can export more, can um, um, can innovate more. And with vaccine development, we're already seeing this. We have to be self-reliant. We also have to be self-reliant on the active pharmaceutical ingredients that go into a pharmaceutical industry. A lot of them, a lot of that comes from China and other countries. So we have to be able to bring those supply chains back to India. So you know, I can go on, and I'll be happy to bring so up more points during the, the discussion. I'll but, come back. Sorry, to you. Uh, I'll come Great. back to you with a specific question, but uh, like everyone else, I'm going to be connecting you with a few emails with some of the speakers here, and I hope you will build a conversation with them uh, post this event as well. Uh, My and, pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Nisha. Uh, let me uh, turn to uh, Anir. You've heard a uh, lot of speakers this evening uh, under the digital Bangladesh agenda. Uh, you know, there has been a determined push, and I was telling my colleagues when I traveled to Dhaka, uh, I, I've been traveling there a few times now. We host a big platform there that for me, I, I love the energy in that city. I love the tech energy in that city. I think that city is going to be one of the big tech hubs. You are one of those uh, uh, important actors in that space. Now, how do you see uh, these new governance platforms built around technology uh, serving Bangladesh in its fight against the pandemic? Uh, how do you see them eventually responding to human capital questions around health education skilling? And uh, where do you see partnerships uh, blossoming in the regional and global context. Okay. Thank you, Samir. A lot of uh, very insightful comments from all the uh, panelists here. So I'm good to see some familiar faces. Someone that is here, a few others as well. So good to see all of you. So Bangladesh has been a late entrant in the digital space. You know that uh, when our Honorable Prime Minister in 2008 uh, made the clarion call of digital Bangladesh, that's when the ball started rolling in, in reality, actually. 
So the digital Bangladesh is really a widespread and accelerated digital acceleration agenda of the government, uh, which is both a whole of government and a whole of society approach. Uh, I'll talk about uh, COVID very quickly, but uh, just to give you a context of uh, what we have achieved in the last uh, 10 or so years in terms of reducing time, cost and visit using digitization. These are the three metrics that we use to measure our progress. We have reduced about 2 billion man days in our service delivery process across the country. About $8 billion have been saved by citizens and about 1 billion visits have been eliminated. So that's what digitization, even at the early stage of 10 years or so, has really achieved for us. Now let me talk about COVID because I know that we are running out of time and I won't go into the details of what we have done in digital Bangladesh, but the response uh, in the last three months of our COVID existence has been rapid and it has uh, ridden the, the infrastructure, the mindset change, the digital transformation that has happened within the government and within the private sector and the collaboration between the two. I'll give you a couple of stories actually. So uh, at the very beginning in March when COVID hit us, uh, we started looking at looking at contact tracing. And as uh, we heard the story of Arugya Situ, we Arugya Situ was not there at that time, uh, but we had traced together from Singapore. So we looked at it and we said, OK, let's let's go and maybe adopt it or build something similar. But we realized very quickly that only 35% of our users had sm uh, smartphones which had Bluetooth. So 65% of the people would not be reached, but it was something that was necessary. So we set up a call center uh, with IVR and USSD and uh, a few internet tools as well uh, for people to do uh, self-reporting. So till, till date, we had about uh, 11 million calls and internet reports that have come in and has helped us do contact tracing in a, in a fairly different way. But we launched a Bluetooth platform called Corona Tracer very recently, so which adds to the capability. What this has allowed us to do is to identify disease transmission and disease clusters, with, even before testing starts. In March, we had only one test labs and maybe about uh, 500 or so testing capacity a day which has increased to about 20,000 now, but still not enough. But uh, this syndromic surveillance platform using some of the older phone technology plus the newer technologies has allowed us to predict disease clusters about seven to 10 days ahead of time, even before testing starts. So we can actually target interventions uh, very quickly. We did that by repurposing. Uh, Nisha talked about uh, re-engineering old things. So we repurposed a national helpline called Triple Three. So people called into Triple Three to get all sorts of information about government services. Uh, even uh, they could apply for passports and uh, land records and so on and so forth. So that was repurposed. That was a known tool for people, so we didn't have to rebrand. So that was repurposed for this call. So that was a story of how use uh, in a within a matter of uh, two to three weeks repurpose that that to become a to make it into syndromic surveillance tool. Uh, uh, we heard about uh, telemedicine. So telemedicine was not popular at all because we just didn't know the business model around it. In a matter of weeks, now it has become very popular. So we have about 20 telemedicine companies that are for, that have formed public private partnership with the government and all the COVID positive patients now go through telemedicine first. So that's a remarkable change that has happened again within a very short period of time. Uh, the reason this was uh, this was possible was unprecedented data collaboration between the private sector and the government across uh, the Ministry of ICT, across uh, the Ministry of Health and the telco. So this has never happened before, but it was it was possible because because COVID happened. We've been talking about it for a while, setting up public good with private data but never happened, but COVID made it happen. Let me talk a little bit about education. Uh, within 10 days of the school shutting down at the end of March, we took our education system to TV. We had a, a, a parliament TV platform, uh, a single channel that was hardly used because we had parliament sessions and that's the only reason this TV channel exists. So we realized that it's 90% uh, not used and during pandemic, the parliament sessions were not in, in place. So why not use it for education? So we started producing massive amount of content and there was also again private sector coming in to produce content along with teachers. We have a teachers portal where about uh, half the teachers of the country are in that portal. So they started producing content. So you have this massive amount of content every day, about 10 hours of content delivery on TV. 
but I'll talk about the challenges as well of this platform. So we just did a, a assessment of that. Only about 56% of our children are accessing TV for education. So what, what is the rest of the 44% doing? Uh, we don't know, and that's uh, that's making us worried. And then we have to come up with something something new. So as we are developing new innovations, we're also measuring the impact of those innovations and trying to come up with alternatives and even newer innovations there. Uh, we just launched two days ago a virtual classroom for all the universities because the universities are shut down and uh, most universities don't use online uh, platforms for education delivery. So this new platform will actually help us deliver education for all the 100 plus universities that, that are across the country. So this will be again another public good driven from uh, the cabinet, the prime minister's office, ministries of education from the program that I run and this will be used with uh, all the universities. Let me talk about the court system. So the court system was shut down, obviously, and we had a huge number of bail petition uh, piling up and uh, prisoners in jails that could have gone out in bail were not being released. So what we did was we repurposed a, a government ERP system uh, that is used for government decision making. Again, repurposed for the court system. Again, took us about three weeks to deploy that within the Supreme Court and a few of the district courts. Uh, and the first intervention was to do bail hearing. So we use video conferencing for the witnesses. We use video conferencing in the prisons. And uh, we've been trying to do this for the last five years. Didn't happen. But again, COVID made it happen in three weeks by repurposing some tools that we already had. Uh, so this now the, the, the Chief Justice has made the decision uh, by seeing the impact of this, that this will be rolled out across 2000 courts by the end of the year for not just bail petition, but for all kinds of hearing. Uh, so we'll get fully digital court within the next uh, one year or so. Uh, relief distribution. I think we heard the story uh, from Niti Aayog that uh, uh, the Aadhaar platform and the, the, the uh, cash benefits, uh, the, the, the direct benefits transfer that has been going on in India is a great story. So we learned from that and we had been developing a platform similar to Aadhaar for the last uh, few years. And a lot of our social safety net program had already been digitized. And we had a target of taking all safety net programs to digital platform by the end of next year. But COVID accelerated that. So now all of a sudden over weeks, we now have most of our uh, benefit programs uh, delivered digitally. Interestingly, we had to add about uh, 5 million new households which had never been on uh, any kind of social safety net program. So the, we are calling these the, the new poor, people who are uh, uh, focused on or dependent on a daily labor, right? So they pull rickshaws, they do construction work, they sell vegetables on the street and bazaars. So they have suddenly become jobless. So these 5 million new, new, new households were again identified using technology. Now we are exploring whether we can do better targeting using telco data. So how people's spending patterns have changed in terms of top ups and money transfers using telco. And that will give us another dimension of uh, maturity in terms of targeting the poor. Uh, E-commerce has taken a different turn. So e-commerce for the last uh, 20 years or so in Bangladesh has been a largely urban phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And 90% uh, of the products sold uh, was actually luxury items, not, not daily necessities. Mm -hmm. So within about six weeks, this has become the reverse. So it's become largely semi-urban and rural because that infrastructure existed with post offices and a few other uh, delivery companies, but was never tapped in. Uh, also, 90% of the products have become daily necessities, groceries and uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, medicines and so on and so forth, not the luxury items. So there is a transformation, but we still saw that uh, a lot of people uh, were not able to access the internet for e-commerce. So we introduced what is called the P-commerce, phone commerce. So they can then call into this uh, triple T hotline and then make an order over phone. They have to pay, of course, but a lot of people are being helped to this new P-commerce phenomenon. We launched a telemedicine service for the expatriates who were not able to. We have about 10 million people working in different countries, mostly in the Middle East. So we launched this uh, primarily in the Saudi Arabia and Bahrain last month, and then another 10 or so countries will actually be adopting this very, very quickly because the expatriate workers that we have in those countries are not getting medical help because they're second class citizens in those in those countries. 
uh, they also cannot speak the language sometimes. So that's where they are getting a lot of help. Uh, uh, we heard the PP production and pharmaceuticals in India. So we also have something called the Innovation Lab, which brought in a number of startups to work on local production of PPEs, ventilators. There are about 18 startup companies now producing uh, low cost ventilators, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, so I'll end with just uh, four realizations of what has happened and how it has happened. So the first thing, how it has happened is that we were able to repurpose a lot of tools and technologies and platforms. The second thing is that the collective data intelligence that has never happened before in Bangladesh, at least, came together very, very quickly. The third is the culture of experimentation in public service that Digital Bangladesh is all about, uh, promoting experimentation, innovation, recognition and reward for testing out new things within government. So that has been accelerated during this COVID time frame. Uh, we're looking at huge job losses. We did a fourth industrial revolution type of a, uh, assessment last year when there was no COVID and we realized that we'll be losing about 5 million jobs in the next 10 to 12 years. But we did a recalculation during the COVID time. And that number is a few times more even by next year. So we're looking at maybe potentially 28 million job losses by next year. So we'll be doing some experimentation, collaboration uh, between private and public sector. The fourth thing that we saw is unprecedented collaboration. Again, uh, we had to get the protocol right before COVID to get two ministers to talk to each other. So who's the more senior minister, who's the junior secretary and so on and so forth, and whose office would we meet in? Because of COVID, we're meeting over Zoom and uh, uh, Microsoft Teams and WebEx. So there is no protocol. So actually, brought those things down and so that lack of protocol has allowed us to move very quickly and set up collaboration within government and within the private sector so i think that was uh, that was actually quite phenomenal so these are the four things realization that i have allowed us to uh, move forward very quickly i'll just take 30 more seconds i know that you are you are about to stop me but i'll just take 30 seconds about the south south collaboration yeah. so there is a south south network for public service innovation that we set up in bangkok uh, about two years ago and that is about 40 countries some asian countries and african countries so just wanted to point that out it's looking at how public sector is looking at innovation more and more frugal innovation transfer innovation but again it's really about capacity development not cutting and pasting it's really about ecosystem building in these organizations in these countries and it's about breaking down the walls of bureaucracy using tools like WhatsApp. So I call it the WhatsApp bureaucracy because we are able to make a lot of decisions, reforms using WhatsApp without any documents, without any signatures. Thank you very much. Anil, I think that was a very enlightening intervention. Thank you. And I hope uh, once I send you mail after this event and link you up with all of your colleagues, you will find uh, ways to partner both within formal um, networks as well as build your own WhatsApp networks. Um, what I'm going to do now is I, I was going to invite Ashok to speak, but I um, Ashok Malik is additional secretary with the Ministry of External Affairs and Foreign Policy Advisor. But I see there are lots of questions that have been posted by uh, those who are watching us. So I will uh, take the next 10 minutes to pose some of those questions to all of you for quick, rapid responses. Um, uh, and Ashok, I want to start with you. Uh, and rather than give you uh, uh, the mic for uh, for your presentation, which I will publish on the website uh, as a as a. I've already said most of what I was going to say, so it doesn't okay. matter. So I'm going to pose the questions that were asked to Amitabh Khan. You can give those answers. Since he's already spoken what he wanted to say, now why don't you reply I, for him? I can't speak for him, but I can try to speak for myself. So I think the first question, there are two or three in similar way. And let me link it up with what Kate was saying. And I'm going to come to Kate next because there are a couple of questions to Kate and to uh, Patricia and, and Peter. Um, uh, Ashok, the first question is that, do you think that it is now the right time for India to be talking to the UK? to move towards uh, uh, India-UK agreement, very similar to the Paris Agreement on climate. And can that be one of our strategic imperatives over the next 12 months or six months or eight months and work with people like Kate and build a momentum? Well, without going into details, uh, COP26 was a much look forward to event this year. Uh, and there was even talk of very high level participation from India. Uh, of course, nothing was written in stone, but uh, we were looking forward to a uh, uh, a big partnership uh, with the UK and around COP26. So uh, certainly if you can help us move in that direction, that it would be something both governments I know would welcome. So, okay. 
so so kate you have a you have a follow through after this particular meeting uh, but the second question is that uh, people have asked about contract tracing in fact uh, there was a there's a question from uh, bangladesh uh, for uh, tanvi shakil joy x mp bangladesh asks uh, he asks about the possibility of vaccines he asks about uh, contract tracing and other technologies that we have produced he is uh, i think many are asking in fact there are some questions from the from nigeria as well uh, uh, how Uh, proactive are we as a nation and not necessarily as individual entrepreneurs i'll come to nisha with that question later but as a nation are we making a concerted effort to share our experiences and learn from other experiences around technology around contract tracing creating a vaccine program that covers everyone we were the pharmacy of the world at some point right so do we want to play the similar role in the days ahead the, the two separate sets of questions one i'll tackle vaccines in particular uh, as you know india uh, largely private sector india is amongst the world's largest producers of uh, of vaccines especially children's vaccines and amongst the world's largest suppliers of vaccines uh, we've also run a fairly robust uh, domestic immunization program especially for hard to reach areas in the past 2 or 3 years uh, which has been fairly successful uh, in fact we uh, someone spoke about cold storage we experimented with cold storage there as well because one of the reasons we couldn't get immunization to the last mile was because uh, the vaccines used to go bad in the heat and uh, they experimented with even uh, solar uh, energy dr- driven cold storage facilities and so on uh, uh, certainly on vaccines there are several things happening in a very organized manner one india's part of global vaccine development and research uh, initiatives related to covid second they are substantially indian or indian driven initiatives being run out of india which are looking at uh, a vaccine program as well and uh, hopefully could come up with good results uh, especially for the indian strain uh, because there are as you know several strains and the indian strain is is different from the european strain and actually different from the chinese strain as well somewhat is closer to the iranian strain uh, third we put in substantial public money in uh, we are putting in substantial public money in upgrading both qualitatively and quantitatively our vaccine manufacturing facilities because while we as and when a covid vaccine is found we'll have to ramp up production significantly we'll also have to at the same time keep producing the normal vaccines we're producing for the rest of the world so there is a, a substantial amount of pot of money which the government has set aside uh, to help Uh, manufacturers including private sector manufacturers ramp up uh, manufacturing and this is being led by the principal scientific advisor to the prime minister uh, dr vijay raghavan your second set of questions uh, was on uh, uh, are we sharing technologies you know and are, uh, we, are we also seeking them from others uh, like anir was listing a whole list of innovations you know the, the the technology and digital world is is a strange world it's it's completely upended hierarchies Uh, old hierarchies don't apply. We we are all there's no developed and developing country here. We are all grappling with the same wide-eyed curiosity and the same wide-eyed uh, optimism. Uh, we are all learning. I mean, this is a world where a Facebook update saying I'm not well uh, can actually be an epidemiological tool, which it is in some places. So uh, you'd be surprised at the questions we've got uh, for some of our innovations, such as. Uh, Uh, direct cash transfers uh, such as contract tracing such as uh, telemedicine or, or m health as it's called in other parts of the world uh, uh, we've got questions from not just you know traditionally global south countries like from africa or asia on uh, specifically on uh, uh, cash transfers we've, we've got questions from the us and from argentina so uh, on contract tracing we've we've received questions from a whole host of countries so there are there is a lot of curiosity out there and on, on modeling we both uh, shared as well as picked up from other countries in fact there's been a conversation between uh, modeling specialists in the uk and india and elsewhere in india and we all trying to learn from what what the other is doing uh, gate there are a couple of questions for you uh, one is uh, uh, and uh, uh, one is a, a university student who asks um, the very important question around uh, uh, the future of uh, uh, child the, the child at this particular point of time uh, and while the question is uh, related to uh, just the health aspects but it's also around something that you uh, alluded to which is on the education and and the integration of uh, in the emerging world children into the mainstream uh, 
you know, reducing child mortality rates, etc. So uh, the question here is that many of these uh, families who are striving to keep children healthy uh, depend on sectors which have, which, which, as per the uh, Mania Berry, who's undergraduate student, uh, will force them not to insist on green. She's asking, is there a buy? Is there a choice countries need to make? Save the child or go green? And where is that choice going to be? This is undergrad student, so this is a woke student. You have to reply to her. Ah, OK, so no, this is great. It's a, it's a, it's a good question. Um, and I just actually want to refer back to something I heard uh, with some alarm, actually, Peter and Patricia say the idea of using gas and nuclear for electricity is not the future. So um, nuclear and coal, existing nuclear and coal are now more expensive than new solar and wind. It is cheaper to build new solar and wind across the world than it is to use existing coal and nuclear for generation. Think about that. And actually, when it comes to gas, in California already, solar plus storage, so not even new solar on its own, but solar plus storage, so round the clock solar, is already cheaper than new gas, already cheaper than new gas. It's only a matter of time before nuclear and gas are completely obliterated by renewables and storage combined. Their costs are going up, the costs of renewables and storage are going down. So this does relate to um, the question um, that the student poses, that there are many, many, many sectors in which this is no longer a false choice. So let me just give the example of many middle income countries and India as well around the world are pouring taxpayers money into propping up dirty industry that is no longer economic. Those taxes could be used for propping up families, education, health and so on. Now that doesn't negate the fact that there are people around the world who are dependent upon incumbent industries for their livelihood. And that should be the absolute priority of government. We need to make sure that all the money that gets poured into the economy now and over the next 18 months, which will be a lot, goes to people and doesn't go to bankers of dirty incumbent industries that should no longer be propped up by taxpayers. We need to make sure that the money is in the hands of people and progress and that human capital and natural capital and digital become the growth stories of the future, not the stuff that's making us sick in the first place, okay. not the stuff that is throwing people off their lands, drying up farms, accelerating child marriage that is what climate change and pollution do we do not need our money to go to the industries that cause that we need the money to go to the people to protect them and bring them out of this crisis that is the choice uh, there is there is a question for uh, peter uh, and uh, there's also a question for uh, uh, patricia the question for peter is that uh, uh, has covid-19 disrupted education in nigeria and have you been able to leverage technology to resume uh, the skilling and education courses for the students there, for the youth, because it's a young country? This from Shreya Behel, a master's student in University of Bath. Thank you so much. Um, that's a good question. Uh, for want of time, I didn't go into details um, uh, on actually this, some of the initiatives government is currently has currently introduced. Yes, COVID-19 disrupted the educational system in Nigeria because schools are closed, even as I speak. But I said that COVID-19 presented a lot of opportunities at the same time. What are these opportunities? People have now uh, uh, changed platform to digital platform and this is helping because with digital platform, you can reach greater numbers. So a number of innovation has come in in educational system. Some schools have been on, they are using a, a platform, they are using um, internet, they, uh, you know, the service providers have also been very magnanimous. Some mm -hmm. of them provided the bandwidth. So with that, it's, it's changing the old ways of delivering education. So education is now going using technology and actually the missing link in African educational system is use of technology. OK, technology is not the governments are not investing in technology 
to drive education. That is actually the problem. But with this COVID coming and putting everybody in the house, we are now forced to go digital. Mm -hmm. So it's just the beginning. And it's hope that in the next couple of months, the intensity is going to be much higher. Thank you. That's one. Another thing is that uh, with COVID-19, we have come up with a number of innovations for young people, mm -hmm. even in the, uh, in the medical supplies. Young people have come up with a number of innovations and government has budgeted over 100 billion Naira to support, support such innovations. So through the central bank, many of them are putting applications now and by so doing greater jobs, there'll be jobs. Educational system will be improved. Mm -hmm. uh, industrialization will go on. So I think this is just the beginning. The opportunities are more. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Peter. Uh, and Madam Minister, the, you have a two part question. Um, one of course is that uh, Ghana has uh, conducted uh, the largest number of COVID tests. What have been the challenges and um, what did you do right in being able to ramp up your testing? And second, uh, what kind of collaboration is possible between South Asian countries um, and Africa today at this moment? Uh, this is from uh, Peace uh, Chiko Dinaka from Nigeria. Thank you, Zamir. Thank you very much. And I think uh, my first question that we have been recording high numbers of tests in, in Ghana because uh, the initial approach was for the government to bring in a lot of testers. Uh, and we brought in more than 500,000 uh, testers to ensure that we can identify a source because if we, we needed to actually leave it in the bag because we knew that most of the contact or where we are getting the infection is from travelers and other people who've had relationship with other countries. So there was the immediate need to do the contact tracing. So we actually did that through the contact tracing. Mm -hmm. And anybody that has come into contact with uh, an identified positive COVID-19 patient, we identify you through phone calls and other means, other uh, personal contact to do that. As we speak now, we are still doing the contact tracing through the numbers that have been identified as positive. And that has really, really helped with that. The interesting uh, aspect of this, uh, doing the uh, like large number of tests is the fact that locally we, we were able to have some health uh, uh, healthcare technology company that could also come up with instant testing uh, materials. And that has actually helped a lot of uh, people that have been identified with that COVID in. And if instantly we can tell that you have uh, contacted the virus, we were able to deal with it. I think these were the two approaches that we were actually developed. But talking about the Asian, African Asian uh, okay. collaboration, it's very, very important. Because listening to my sister from uh, India, I realized that there are a lot of initiatives that are coming up uh, that we have adopted the local uh, technologies and developed them to ensure that our healthcare systems are rich in talking about sup uh, the, the supply chain that has to be retained in India is one of the focal things that we need to look at. Uh, at uh, I mentioned that uh, we have our local uh, pharmaceuticals mm -hmm. or what I call the herbal medicine that is being improved upon and its application is also very, very essential. And when it happens like that, it helps everybody to be able to deal with the pandemic as quickly as possible. Because we have with our local, uh, what I, I call the steam bath, I don't know the medical name for it, though, 
but you, you use local herbs, the steam bath, it clears your respiratory system, and we are able to contain these uh, the, uh, uh, pandemic in that level. So we, the, I don't think we've had a very good collaboration with the Asia, the South Asian uh, countries, but it is very critical that we look at that because I'm impressed with what has been done so far in India, and we believe that by having a lot of conversation, we will be able to transfer uh, technologies and also ensure that we do these things together. That's why initially I talked about partnerships. Thank and you. when we're talking about partnerships, we are talking about country relationships. Thank you, Mr. Minister. Uh, Madam Minister, we are going to be bringing together uh, some smaller gatherings. We'll bring some of the Indian entrepreneurs and we'll try and bring a smaller meeting for you, for Peter and for others in smaller groups where we can have longer discussions. I want to close this evening by posing two questions to uh, both Anir and Nisha, because I think those in a sense relate to both of you. The question is uh, that A, are ethics going to guide uh, are geoethics and ethics going to guide the future of our technological world? Are people thinking about ethics as we become highly digitized and high, as we roll out these big technology programs that both of you are speaking about? Where does ethics fit into it? Or are we going to find ourselves in a bubble a few years later where we are struggling with a different kind of crisis? Second, are we responding to the bottom of the pyramid as we build these technologies or are we on the quest for market share? So what are we trying to solve using technologies uh, is the focus and emphasis uh, 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 responding to our realities that we uh, abide? So this is the second question they've asked. And the final question they've asked is, is someone worrying about quality? Uh, Nish, in fact, Nisha, it's a direct question to you. You mentioned about lowering of regulatory barriers. They are worried that do we have regulatory capacity in Bangladesh and India and other parts of these uh, 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 other countries to monitor these high technology products? So is technology is ramping up of regulatory capability keeping up with uh, our highly innovative societies? But I think it applies to both of you because I think Bangladesh and India joined at the hips, uh, uh, South Asian countries with a lot of technology promise. Uh, first to Nisha and the final word to you, Anid, this evening. I will then ask uh, Sandhya to say a few words and close this conversation. I'm so sorry we have taken longer than uh, we had planned, uh, but we will get better at this next time. So Nisha, over to you. And then to Thanks, Anira. So, so just to clarify the point, uh, India did not lower any reg regulatory barriers. Our uh, standard for regulatory is still as high as it ever was. It's just the time frames to pro do the due diligence, to check the compliance, to check the certifications and let the product go into the market. Those timelines were shortened. And uh, uh, I, I guess they had more people from the regulatory authorities coming into work and working at full full speeds, you know, working via Zoom, working via video conferencing to do a lot of the due diligence online. And then having these products come into the virology labs, having these products come into the hospital to do very, uh, to, uh, it, so it was almost, so usually you have a waiting time of about three to six months to even get into a virology, a national certified virology lab. Now it took two days because there was a very quick database that the government put together, asked for people to uh, submit their uh, you know, two page brief on what their products can do. And that the government immediately had these products come in into the virology labs to get tested and then into the hospitals to test against actual patients. So no, no uh, regulatory more, barriers more, were lowered. More intense work. Just more intense work, time frames were reduced, but quality, I mean, you'll always have shoddy products, you know, maybe yeah. two, three percent coming into the market. But in general, India's regulatory burden has not reduced. And if anything, at a time of COVID, if any company has screwed up and put low quality products into the market, so help them. This is not the time to, uh, you know, uh, send in low quality products. So I don't think our regulatory capacity has been diminished in terms of quality. It has only increased in terms of reducing timeframes, allowing products to go into the market very quickly. So with that question answered, I'll move to geoethics, right? I think we were already embroiled in a pretty big geoethics debate around many topics, climate change, of course, one as Kate was alluding to. Then we had artificial intelligence, data privacy. I think data privacy is in continuing to go become one of the biggest debates around the world. So many of these geoethics and now COVID has presented another one. Everyone has raised questions as to whether we are too globalized, whether we're too interlinked, 
and at a time like this if you know it's like a domino effect one domino falls and then everyone falls together so there's i think there's going to be a lot of debate and there already is starting with forums like this as to how we can build self reliance but continue to work together across the globe and that's where technology is going to play a big a uh, big role you know if you look at uh, for example zooms uh, market uh, growth right and okay. if you look at versus the airlines did we ever think that zoom would be a competitor to airlines no this so it's building up all these new business dynamics new ways of collaborating and i think that's where the next set of geoethic questions will come out um where what went wrong with this virus being, it was such a simultaneous global and swift effect what happened and how do we decouple but still stay interlinked that i think is going to be some of the biggest questions we answer in the next decade thank so you. with that i'll 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 let mr chaudhry thank you thank you very much uh, i mean they were uh, by the way i have not asked you a number of questions that came your way i will send you by email and i'll connect you to the people there were lots of questions for you i think your story of bangladesh was compelling but uh, these two questions to you ali the ones i asked nisha thank you uh so i'd just echo what nisha said uh, so quality i've i've not seen being compromised uh, both in the pharmaceutical uh, the medical space but also in other areas uh, there is a lot of dead time in in when regulation happens so meet different meetings that need to be set up so those have been compressed i mean there is so well, one thing that we do well in bangladesh we've been doing as part of digital bangladesh is what is called service process simplification so a lot of simplification has been done unnecessary steps have been eliminated and because of the higher sense of urgency uh, some of these regulations have been prioritized so they were done much more quickly so dead time has been eliminated so that's how i, I will not say that any quality has been compromised i have not seen that uh, uh, in terms of ethics i'll just uh, take 30 seconds to tell you a story uh, i was in bangalore a couple of years ago and there was a, it was a, on a financial inclusion seminar looking at this nandan nilakani was there we talked about her quite a bit look at uh, financial inclusion for the next 8 uh, years so that was in 2017 so it was uh, so looking at 2025 uh, how finances will work and there was a study that was uh, released uh, so it was it had a european uh, american part to it so developed country versus uh, african and indian uh, uh, subcontinent part to it Uh, and we saw two different answers there so in terms of data privacy that was one of the questions uh, data privacy was number one issue in the developed context and in the emerging context uh, services were the number one issue data privacy was much lower in the in the list of priorities as people were responding so in terms of uh, geoethics i think it's a it's a very contextual thing and it's also an evolving thing so as we are dealing with huge amounts of data medical data uh, telco data which we're trying to anonymize uh, international travel data as uh, many of our expat workers are coming back so are they covid positive uh, are they getting tested properly i mean do we quarantine them so all these issues so we need travel data that is also confidential so all this huge amounts of data privacy so i think these are evolving questions that we have to answer with context so i'm giving you a fairly ambiguous answer because that's all i have right now but as far as bottom of the pyramid is concerned that is an absolute priority so as far as technology is concerned i've seen more bottom of the uh, bottom of the pyramid being addressed in the last few months than ever before so absolutely i think we are very much on the ball as far as uh, addressing bottom of the pyramid issues with technology thank you very much thank you ani and let me finally turn to uh, sandhya sandhya uh, is the deputy director at the uh, bill and melinda gates foundation she and i had been conspiring to Uh, put together a, a, a conversation that brings together different uh, voices and actors from all parts of the world, and it's taken a few, uh, taken us a few months to put this together. But uh, Sandhya, your thoughts on this conversation? Please. Thank you, Samir, and yes, we've been conspiring to do this, and I'm, I'm. Thank you so much because I think it's been a fascinating discussion, and uh, I can't close it because actually I want to add to it. because yeah. while it was absolutely fascinating there was one part of the title that i uh, i would say got didn't quite get the importance that it needed which was the governance innovation so we've talked about technology a lot which is uh, which indeed needs the focus that it got and maybe a lot more but just on the governance innovations i want to take 30 40 seconds and talk about yeah. some interesting stuff that india has done 
So while the government, not only in India, but across the world, has played a very, very important role, uh, the primary role actually in, in addressing COVID, but there are other platforms and structures that have been absolutely critical. And two that I want to uh, highlight from the India context have been community platforms, which in India we call self-help group platforms, and the other is a local governance platform. Um, you know, even when I look at this from the lens of technology, while we have DBT, for example, um, at the last mile, uh, technology can also fall through the gaps, and that's where these governance structures are very, very critical and play a very important role. So whether we talk of the community platforms or the local governance platforms, uh, both of these have played such an array of roles in the COVID response, starting from communications to ensuring the entitlements, DBT, uh, the food entitlements reach the most marginalized communities. Uh, in India, there's been a huge humanitarian crisis uh, in addition to the health crisis with the whole uh, travel of migrant populations. So these platforms have actually played a very important role in helping to manage the migrant populations, uh, monitor their quarantines. And, uh, you know, uh, we talked about livelihoods. They've played a very important role in mapping the skill sets of the migrant populations and trying to assess what are the kind of job opportunities that may be. It is the end of the day. I know we've overrun, so I'm not going to talk too much about it. But I just wanted to highlight that these are very innovative governance mechanisms, which which are also something that we should think about as we talk of these exchanges. And I just want to end with this has been a fascinating conversation for the foundation. We are looking more and more at these global exchanges because we do believe that, you know, as Nisha, you already said, it is a very globalized world and we have to look at exchanges which are necessarily going to be two way exchanges. It's not just about sort of India sharing its lessons, but equally learning from other countries. There's so much to learn from African experiences. Anir outlined a whole range of Bangladesh experience. And we are looking to see how we can facilitate this dialogue. And as Sami said, you know, we're we are sort of conspirators and partners in crime on this journey. Um, so thank you. And I hope we're going to continue this, as Sami said, in smaller groups. No, I think, uh, uh, Sandhya, you made a very important point, something that we've spoken about earlier, but I think the ASHA workers, when it comes to the health sector, Akshay Patra, when it comes to midday meals, the many uh, uh, private foundations uh, from the Indian private sector and others who've stepped yeah. up, uh, many of the local uh, civil society organizations which okay. have been involved uh, through technology to play a far more influential role than we ever thought they would. I think Correct. those are uh, equally important actors to chronicle when the uh, when the narrative of this um, pandemic is built up. And I think one of our future conversations could be around uh, these uh, uh, new actors. And uh, is there a learning between uh, these different regions on the role of these civil society organizations, uh, innovative governance uh, institutions, etc. So thank you very much. I know I have, uh, uh, I'm late. I have many, many apologies. I promise to be better next time. We will uh, stick to the clock. And uh, but we've had a fascinating conversation. We've had lots of uh, interest from the audience, lots of questions posed to all of you. Uh, thank you for joining us to the audience. We will be putting this out on our social media uh, uh, forums. Uh, please follow all these fantastic people and their work. And if any of you want to link up with them, please send me an email. I will connect you all. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you to the speakers. Without you, this would not have been possible.